A couple of years ago, a British tabloid accused Max Mosley, the then president of Formula One's governing body, of taking part in what it called a sick Nazi orgy. It even had photos from a video that it posted on the web. Max Mosley, my guest today, sued the paper and won. The judge ruled there was no evidence of a Nazi theme, so there was no public interest in running the story. But we all still know about his private life, and that's why he's now asking the European Court of Human Rights to restrain Britain's press. Is he right, and should it rule in his favour? Max Mosley, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Now, you sued the paper concerned, the News of the World. You won. They paid you damages of £60,000. You were vindicated. So why are you taking this further step of going to the European Court? Well, because they should never have published the story in the first place. And what they do quite often is they, when they have a story that they know shouldn't be published and a judge would stop if he knew about it, they keep it secret from the person, don't say anything to the person beforehand, and then they publish, after which it's really too late to do anything, because if it's a private matter, you can't get it back out of the public mind once it's been published. And they know that if you sue them, you will end up either losing a lot of money if you lose the case, but if you, even if you win the case, it costs you more money, you don't get your money back, in fact you end up out of pocket, plus all the private information gets repeated again. But in their case, they say that they believed what was written and it was legitimate to publish because their argument was, here it was, yes, it was a sex case, but there were Nazi overtones to it, which they said justified their publication because you were head of the Formula One governing body. Well, yes, but you see, their Nazi allegation when we got to court completely fell to pieces. There were hundred and more than a hundred photographs shown to the editor and he was asked to point out one Nazi element. Couldn't do so, there wasn't one. They completely invented that aspect. So you think all along they, they were just looking to what, titillate their readers? Entirely, because that's what they do, that's what they're in business to do. But their argument, I mean, we, I mean, we have to take on face value what they say, which is that there was a public interest in publishing it, which is why they put, I mean, they know there is, you had the recourse to the law. And they would have known that. So why would they risk publishing if they really thought they were going to go drag through the court and, and, and... They never thought for one moment that I would sue them. Because most people in that situation, once the thing's been published, the lawyers will say to you, there's no point in suing. Because if you sue, the private information gets repeated. And on top of that, it'll cost you a lot of money. So once they've got the story out, they think you won't sue. They thought I wouldn't sue. What did your lawyers say to you? Did they tell you not to sue? Well, the lawyers said, they pointed out the difficulty. They said, first of all, you'll end up with a big bill, even if you win. It costs you about £30,000, what it costs in the end. And on top of that, all this private information will be repeated in court. So you've nothing to gain by suing other than, of course, uh, creating a precedent, which is what I wanted to do. You said, and the judge, and ju the Justice E.D., the judge in this case, uh, accepted that your life had been ruined by what happened. Has it? Well, in a sense, yes, because you work all your life, particularly, I mean, I was then 68, I'm older now. You work all your life to achieve certain things. You get a reputation. And something like that happens, that's what you're remembered for. Well, it means that really, in a way, anything you've done that's useful and constructive is swept aside by one tiny part of your life which this newspaper decides they're going to expose. Tell us what it's like, because you had what was very private, I mean, the nature of it, and very intimate, very private part of your life, which you told MPs you had sort of been taking part in for 45 years. So, when that suddenly becomes public, what's it like? Well, it's quite a shock. I mean, it, first of all, obviously, I don't take the news of the world. I don't know anybody who does. But when I got a phone call on the Sunday morning saying this story had appeared, I went out and bought a couple of copies. 
And yes, it's a, it's a shock. So the first you knew of it was when somebody called you and said, look in the papers? Absolutely. It was the first I knew. And that was the first your wife, your family knew? First my wife or family knew. Nobody knew anything about this. And my wife, actually, and my family, didn't know that I every now and then went and did this. It was completely secret. So what was, what was it like in the Mosley household that Sunday morning? Well, my wife's first reaction was she thought I, I had the paper printed as a joke, as a sort of thing I might do, a sort of thing, you know, obviously she knowing nothing that this was actually happening. But then, of course, I had to explain, no, it wasn't a joke. What did she say? Well, she was unhappy. Just and your, your children, of course, as well. Well, yes, because I think it's it, almost worse for them, because putting myself in their place, to see those sort of pictures of your father, terrible. I mean, it, acutely embarrassing. And they're not only embarrassing for you as the child, but also all your friends knowing. Everybody knows. And suddenly there's this strange thing that your father's doing is public. It's about as embarrassing as you can think of. You, you wrote in a Guardian article just a few weeks ago that tabloid revelations can cause great pain, even suicide. Did you ever think of taking your own life? I didn't because I was completely focused on doing what I fortunately was in a position to do, which is going after them and then creating a precedent and trying to get this sort of thing stopped in the future. But there are cases, ordinary people, not celebrities at all, there are two cases, well known, where the, they expose swingers, people who like to sort of swap part partners and so on. And the two men concerned both committed suicide because they simply couldn't bear the exposure. What did, if there had been Nazi overtones to it, do you think it would have been in the public interest for that publication? Well, my personal view is no, but that's debatable. I mean, then the, they would have at least had an argument. But as it was, they completely invented that aspect and they had no argument. You were the head of the Formula One governing body at the time. If you had been the Prime Minister and there hadn't been the Nazi overtones, just the sex stuff, do you think that would have been in the public interest? Again, my view is no, but you see, that's the whole point, that there can be an argument, I suppose you're Prime Minister, as you say, there can be an argument that it's in the public interest to know. And of course there is a weighing procedure, public interest versus the right to privacy. And this is a very delicate balance sometimes. But what I'm saying is that balance should be conducted by a judge. It should not be conducted by a new tabloid editor. Because what you are going to the European Court to ask for is for prior notification that if a paper wants to run a story, whatever the story, they must go to the individual concerned and let them know in advance. Yes, because then the individual concerned, if they think they've got a case, and if their lawyers think they've got a case, they can go to a completely independent High Court judge and say, would you stop this pending trial? Because it's only an interim procedure. It means that until the trial of the action, the thing is kept secret. For the very obvious reason that if you win the action, so it should have been kept secret, if it's published beforehand, it destroys the whole purpose of your litigation. The, the trouble is, though, that there are pl plenty of people who have huge sympathy with you, journalists, editors, commentators, who say, look, you were wronged, but what you are doing now is wrong because of the effect that such a law or such a ruling could have on the way journalism works in this country and on press freedom. And the, one of the examples that's used um, over and over again is that of the telegraph story on MPs expenses that if they had to go to each MP when they were running the story to get to tell them an injunction was sought it could have a delaying effect and add costs that would make questionable whether the paper would run it in the first place I think that's a complete fallacy first of all the MPs knew that the expenses story was coming out and any MP who knew that and went to his lawyer and said, can I get this stopped? The lawyer would say, you've got no chance at all. No judge would ever give an injunction. And that's why not one single MP, although they all knew this was coming out, not one single MP asked for an injunction. But uh, what, under what you are proposing, the Telegraph would have had to go to the individuals concerned. Yes, but they, they went to them in any event. Most of these MPs were asked beforehand to comment on this. But one of the... One of the dangerous things that it's being suggested will happen is that just the very nature of having to do that in certain cases if there's even a temporary delay it can affect it will affect the news value on the story it will affect the exclusivity that the paper has it makes it harder and more costly for the newspaper and they are therefore less likely 
to commit themselves to investigative journalism? Uh, I think, again, that is a fallacy, because what happens is that the, if you go, there won't be a delay. If there's notice, a day, two days, whatever, then the, the victim, if I can call him that or her, would go to a judge. Now, the judge would then weigh up the public interest versus the, uh, the, sorry, the, the right of the public to know versus the individual's privacy. And unless the individual could demonstrate to the judge that they were more likely than not to win the action, it's a very high test, the judge would refuse the injunction. The judge will only give an injunction if it's very clear that the information should not be published. But you make the point about the costs on your court case even of winning. And Professor Greenslade, who's a former editor of a tabloid and pre professor of journalism mm. now, reckoned that in the case that we're talking about, the expenses, the expenses stories, each case, if the Telegraph had won each case, it would have cost them £10,000. If they'd lost on a case, it would have cost them £60,000. And that's for each MP. I mean, you've got escalating costs yes, there. But I, I say again, the MPs knew they didn't go for an injunction because they knew they wouldn't get one. There's no chance of getting an injunction. So there's no point in going and asking for an injunction if you're the MP because it will be refused and you will end up paying the costs. The MPs would never have gone near it and didn't. What about the case of, for example, Robert Maxwell, the BBC Panorama, which um, exposed his financial dealings? If he'd known in advance, he could have got, sought an injunction. And even a temporary delay on a story like that would have perhaps allowed him to shift finances to cover what he's doing, perhaps put pressure on, on witnesses, and suddenly an important expose disappears. I'm afraid that that's really, with respect, that's really fanciful. You see, what would happen in real life? They would say to him, we are going to show this on Panorama on Monday night. They would have to tell him, let's say, on the Friday. He's now, if he's going to get an injunction, he'll have to go, get one between them and, and Monday night. So there won't be any delay there. He goes to the judge. The judge would say, Mr. Maxwell, you're running a big public company. You've got shareholders. You've got a pension fund. You've got all these things. I'm not going to give you an injunction. You, Maxwell How would, do you know that? I mean, it's down Ma to a judge who's deciding on fairly, in a short time frame, on little bits of evidence. No, the judge is deciding on evidence put by both sides. If there's notice, then that's one of the great advantages of notice, that not only does the judge hear the applicant, he hears the paper as well. He's bound to hear the paper or the television station. The fact of the matter is that Maxwell would not have had the slightest chance of getting an injunction on the facts that were readily available. And also, if, if he'd been in a better position, it should be a judge, not the editor of Panorama, who decides whether that expose is going to take place. But there are editors who say, I mean, the editor of Private Eye, Ian Hislop, makes the point, there are injunctions, there are public interest stories that he is unable to run because a judge has ruled, has, has granted an injunction. So they're sitting on a story months later, unable to use it. He makes the point that you've got this, uh, you just have to prove that it's private by your definition. No, it's complete nonsense. I mean, the fact that if he's sitting on st stories, it can only be stories where the, the public interest, if there is any public interest at all, is less than the right of privacy of the person about whom he's writing. Otherwise, the judge would not give an injunction. Okay, well, what about the case of The Guardian, who got some memos from Barclays about their tax, uh, uh, tax affairs? An injunction was sought and given and Alan Rusbridger, the editor, said it would cost £100,000 to appeal against the, pa the ban. So they just can't afford to do that. Well, I'm very sorry if they can't afford to appeal, but in the end, we live under the rule of law. And if that injunction should not have been granted and an appeal would have succeeded, they should appeal. In my case, it's absolutely clear that nothing should have been done. It, cost me a million, it would have cost me a million pounds if I lost. And, and sorry, it cost the news of the world a million pounds when they lost. But you, you make the point, we live under the rule of law, and there are laws already. You had recourse to the law and you used it. And yes, your, your privacy now, people know about your private life in a way perhaps that they shouldn't. But the trouble with what you're proposing is that because of the expense of using the law, it will affect the freedom of the press in a way that it, it's, it, it may not be fair on you, but does it not damage journalism if what you want happens? Well, no, because what about the expense of, to the individual whose private life is wrongly exposed? He's then put in a position where he has to spend a fortune suing, and at the end of it, his private life is still exposed. In the end, you've got to decide 
who gets priority here. The individual, when he's about to have his life exposed, should be entitled to keep that private until it goes to trial and there's a full hearing. And if it turns out the newspaper is entitled to publish it, then they publish it. But the expense argument is really a non-argument against what I'm saying, because litigation in this country is too expensive. There's no question about it. But that's a separate issue. The fact of the matter is the law should protect the individual. And if the newspapers want to publish this sort of thing, they should be just as prepared to defend their position as the individual should be prepared to attack. But their argument is that the balance is wrong. And then you take a, one of the arguments in your case. You, we, people might know what you get up to in your private life, but you have been vindicated by the courts. They also know that. Your profession supported you. You've won plaudits for the way that you've campaigned on this. It's, you've won respect for being dignified in the way that you've, you've campaigned on it. There has been some redress, in a sense. That's all perfectly true, and I'm grateful for it. But the fact is that something which should not have been made public has been made public, and no judge on earth and no court on earth can make it private again. The point is that the damage, once it's done, is irreparable. My privacy will never, ever be restored. Now, surely, in a rational society, you would say, well, wait a minute, before his privacy is irrevocably destroyed, we will stop this being published until it goes to trial and is heard by a judge and you have a full hearing. And then if it turns out that it should be published, then it's published. But in the meantime, we won't cause him irreparable harm by publishing it. Why go to Europe on this? The government is already looking at the libel laws. It's talked about privacy laws. You could have sought to use the British courts or lobbied the government, and yet you're going to Europe. No, you can't go to Europe without first going through all the UK courts in my case. But the, the reason we didn't go through the UK courts is there is no law. What, what, the problem is not the courts applying the law wrongly. It's the problem is there is no law at all. There is no law that said the news of the world but should... But not then lobby the government to introduce law, because as it is, you'll have judges in Strasbourg deciding on British press. If you lobby the government on something like this, and I did go to the select committee, you get absolutely nowhere. What is likely to happen, though, because the European court will make whatever it's willing. A lot of people think it may well go in your way. But the UK courts here have to take note of it, but they don't have to follow its ruling. No, uh, in my case, because there is no law, if there's a finding, then it would be the duty of the UK government to introduce a law. And that would deal with the details of the thing. And it would also deal with problems like, how do you make sure that on the one side you stop scandal rags publishing things, on the other side you in no way interfere with serious journalism? It is possible to do that without going into great detail. But it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, that, that point about the serious journalism, you must have concerns about what the ramifications of such a law could be. We can stop the sort of things that happen to me and a lot of other people without interfering at all with serious journalism. I'm absolutely satisfied of that. That stage will come when the UK government look at it. All the European court would do, were they to find in my favour, would be to say that the principle of the matter is there should be prior notification. Mark Oton, the Liberal Democrat MP, a married man who uh, was, he was having an affair with a male prostitute and it was revealed by a Sunday paper. He said, I've obviously thought long and hard about whether the news of the world were justified in invading my privacy, and I think at the end of the day they probably were. Well, I disagree, and I, I think what he should have done, he should have gone to court and see, had the thing argued out properly, people putting the case on one side and case on the other, and... He's uh, gone through it all and he thinks that they were justified, and he, this is a former lawmaker. Well, I, I think the thing is that, it depends on your view, my personal view is, that if something takes place in private and everybody is an adult and they're all consenting, then it seems to me they should be allowed to do whatever they like provided none of them causes injury to another that might in fact um, cost society money. What about but, if they're saying certain things in public? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What about if they're saying certain things in public? No, it, it, the moment you say something in public, it's not private. I mean, you've got to have a reasonable expectation of privacy. You should be absolutely sure that what you're doing nobody can see nobody can hear everybody consents everybody is grown up and if that those conditions are satisfied i really can't see why in a adult secular society we can't do what we want 
You, uh, at the time, of course, were, as I say, heading up Formula One's governing body. Bernie Eccleston um, says he wants you back as, as president of, of the body. Are you tempted at all? I don't think he really means that. I think he's being kind. No, I'm not tempted. I did it for altogether 18 years, 16 years, the whole of the FI, two years before that, just for sport. And it's probably too long. And certainly, I wouldn't want to go back. So your successor is doing a better job? I don't know yet. It's too early to tell. The thing is that he approaches the thing in a completely different way, which you would expect. And we won't really know whether he's doing a better job or worse job for another year or two. Of course, the sport still has some of the same problems that there were when you were there. Threats of a split. Uh, we have Ferrari's president saying Formula One is like a prison. Teams should get more money. They should have more control. Do you sometimes think, and particularly sitting outside the sport watching it, that they should just, the leadership should just call his bluff and tell him to go? Yeah, I mean, the, if I'd uh, gone on for another year, which I could have done, I mean, they would have re-elected me, then uh, I would have, would have called his bluff and the breakaway, the split would have collapsed around about February of 2010 because it's completely impossible to run outside the system. So is that what you'd say to the leadership now, call his bluff? Yes, I mean, I don't, think I don't think it'll ever come to that because actually the, my successor is a man of compromise and the only question is whether he compromises too much, but he, uh, I, I doubt it'll come to a conflict with him. So, do you, so now you have no role, you just are a spectator or even that? Well, I'm a, I've got a tiny role in that I'm ex officio a member of the so-called Senate but I haven't been to any meetings. I deliberately stayed away because when I took over, my predecessor used to come to the meetings and sort of haunt the corridors, and I thought that's the wrong thing to do, so I've kept out of it. But I'm very much in touch with everybody. I follow it all still. And you watch on television? I watch it on television. But you spend your time now campaigning for privacy? Yes. Campaigning for privacy really has occupied me fully since I stopped in October 2009, uh, November 2009. Which means, and the aim of, is a Mosley law. I wouldn't call it a Mosley law. I think it's just a, a, a just law that really exists in a lot of other countries. Because somewhere like uh, most of the continental countries, if you want to publish something private, you have to get the person's consent. Well, you can't do that without telling them. Max Mosley, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. Thank you.